So welcome to our webinar on the mixing of viscous fluids. Without more ado, let's get moving. So I'd like to thank you all for joining. Before we get started, I'd like to walk through some housekeeping items. So this presentation is being recorded so that we can send you a recap afterwards. Your camera and audio has been turned off. However, the chat and question and answer functions are enabled for you to submit questions and comments, and I will address them at the end of the presentation and follow up with the group on those that I'm not able to get to. Lastly, I'd like to ask you for your help to complete a brief survey at the end of the presentation. This will help me to improve the quality of our, of our content and will give you an opportunity to voice your opinions and needs regarding our mixing solutions. The survey will also be sent by email afterwards. The survey is only a few questions long, and I'll promise to remind you again at the end of the presentation. So let's get started. So my name is Richard Grenville. Uh, I'm the principal, a principal engineer at, in SPX Flow Mixing Solutions. Um, I've got nearly 40 years of experience in the field of mixing. I started work in 1984 as an applications engineer at Cheminia in their office in the UK. Uh, my experience includes 22 years at DuPont um, and nine years with SPX Flow Philadelphia. I joined Philadelphia Mixing Solutions in 2013 and um, Philadelphia Mixing Solutions was acquired by SPX Flow in May of 2021. I'm an adjunct professor at Rowan University in New Jersey and at the University of Delaware. Um, and the material that we're going to be talking about today is a very abbreviated uh, version of one of the lectures from the course. I'm a chartered engineer, which is the equivalent of a PE in the UK, a fellow of the Institution of Chemical Engineers, also in the UK, and the American Institute of Chemical Engineers. And among other things, I'm a former president of the North American Mixing Forum and uh, the winner of the NAMP Award in 2017. So, SPX Flow Mixing Solutions, the organization I work for, is a, a worldwide organization. We have five brands under our corporate umbrella, and these are Lightning, Philadelphia, Plenty, Steltzer, and New U Technic. And these brands represent a wide range of mixing applications across the process industry, including minerals and mining, biotechnology, paints and coatings, uh, very relevant to what we're going to talk about today, as well as the nutrition and health fields. We have four labs where we are doing um, fundamental research to develop new mixing technologies and to carry out targeted uh, testing for our customers to help improve their processes. And I do believe that we are the premier mixing organization uh, in the world at the moment. We have a lot of experience uh, and a lot of efforts and dedicated to developing uh, mixing solutions for our customers. Here's our agenda. What are we going to talk about today? So first is the definition of mixing. What is mixing? Then we're going to talk about viscosity. We're talking, obviously, we need to understand and have a de definition of what viscosity is. How do we define it? How do we measure it? And then what are Newtonian and what are non-Newtonian fluids? What's the difference? Then we're going to look at blending in the laminar regime as a, an example of a process that is affected by viscosity. Look at traditional impeller selection and design rules. Then we're going to look at mixing properties affected by viscosity, the power drawn in the laminar regime, by, power drawn by the impeller in the laminar regime, and then the blend time in the transitional and laminar regimes. Then we're going to talk about a special case of non-Newtonian fluids, which are fluids with a yield stress. And we're going to say a few words about counterflow impellers, which are impellers that we uh, use and sell for these types of processes. And then we'll finish off with some conclusions. So what is mixing? So this definition comes from a gentleman called Art Etchels, who is a retired uh, Duponter, he retired as a Dupont Fellow, which is the highest technical level you can reach as a technical person within Dupont. Um, and his definition is mixing is the application of mechanical motion 
in order to create fluid dynamic effects which achieve a process result. So the customer, the user of the mixer, is interested in the process result. Why are we mixing? And there's lots of reasons. And this is not, not a comprehensive list. We could be doing a chemical reaction. We could be doing dissolving solids. We could be doing mass transfer between the solid and the liquid leaching out a valuable metal from ore. Could be concerned with heat transfer. We could be concerned with uh, making solids through precipitation or crystallization. Solid suspension becomes important if we're making solids. We need to prevent fouling. Fouling is a very common problem when we're mixing viscous liquids. Could simply be a storage tank. And as we talk to customers about what they're doing, we get into kind of more specialized questions like, does the level change? If the level's constant, then that's a much easier system to design than one where the, the level is changing. So we'll have a conversation, discuss the desired process result, and then we have to decide what mixing phenomena phenomenon drives the process result. And it could be mean flow, where we're thinking about the mixes as a pump, thinking about the velocity of the fluid as it moves around the vessel. And the second is turbulence and shear, where we're creating stresses, shear stresses to break up a second phase. It could be an oil and water, we could be deagglomerating solids, we could be dispersing gas. But in order to reduce the size of that second phase component, we have to create stresses in the liquid, in the fluid. So having discussed the process, decided what kind of impellers we should be using, then we can get to selecting the impeller type, the geometry and the operating speed. And we may iterate, we may come back down to the discussion of desired process result. But we're following the definition, moving from the bottom of the ladder to the top and coming up with an impeller design, speed, power input, torque on the shaft that we need in order to do what you, the customer, need the mixer to do. So. Let's talk a little bit about viscosity. What is viscosity? So this is the definition from Wikipedia. The viscosity of a fluid is a measure of resistance to, of the fluid to gradual deformation by shear stress or tensile stress. So for liquids, it corresponds to the informal concept of thickness. For example, honey is much has a much higher viscosity than water. It's thicker than water. And water has a much higher viscosity than air. Air has a viscosity. So what does this mean? How is it measured? What are the units? So if you've taken a fluid mechanics course, you will recognize this sketch. Uh, so we're looking at two plates with area A separated by a gap Y. And we fill the space in between the two plates with a fluid. We exert a force to the upper plate and it accelerates until it's traveling with a velocity V. The shear stress that we're exerting on the fluid is the force divided by the area and the shear rate is the velocity gradient. So it's V minus zero, the bottom plate isn't moving, divided by one, the gap. So those are classic definitions and the viscosity, the dynamic viscosity of the fluid is the shear stress divided by the shear rate. So conceivably, we could put our um, fluid in a gutter, put a plate on top of it, drag it along the surface and extract this information. But it's, that's not very sensible. So what we use in our lab is, is a device called a Couette viscometer. So the Couette viscometer has uh, parts called a bob. The bob spins and the cup, which is stationary like a, I guess a rotor and a stator. So the viscos viscometer measures the torque on the shaft. And from the torque on the shaft, we can extract the shear stress. The shear rate is the velocity at the edge of the bob divided by the gap. So we measure the stress of a range of rotational speeds, and we plot the shear stress, which is measured versus the shear rate over that range of speeds. So one important thing to recognize is you have to measure, make the measurements over the range of shear rates that you expect to see in the device that you're designing, whether it's a mixer, pump, pipe flow, 
a, a spray nozzle for spraying paint. The shear rates in a spray nozzle are orders of magnitude higher than the shear rates we'd expect to see in a stirred tank. So you need to make sure that you make the measurements over the range of shear rates that you expect to see. So these are components. This is the Brookfield RST viscometer that we use in our lab. There's the, there's the motor and the torque measuring equipment. Here are the cups or a variety of shapes of cups and here are the bobs. And you select the bob and the, the cup depending on the viscosity that you expect to be measuring. And this is all computer controlled. Um, here's the cable going back to the computer. The computer controls the, the speed, uh, acceleration and deceleration. And it also measures the data and then fits the data to the, the best rheological model that uh, will, will it correlate it, correlate the data. So having talked about correlating the data, we're engineers, and in order to do engineering calculations, we need an equation that describes the fluid's behavior. And the simplest equation is called the power law. So this is the shear stress that we're measuring. This is the shear rate. And the, there are, we extract two constants from doing the regression, the K and the N value, which I'll explain in a second. So. The, by definition, the dynamic viscosity of the fluid is the shear stress divided by the shear rate. So we can simply simply say that the shear, the apparent viscosity of the fluid at the shear rate we're measuring is K times the shear rate raised to the power N minus one. So there, there are two terms that we extract from our measurement to describe the fluid behavior. And first, the consistency K describes the thickness of the fluid. The second is N the index, and that describes the degree of curvature or non-Newtonianness that the fluid is um, displaying. So if n is less than one, the fluid is shear thinning. The exponent in this equation is negative. So as the shear rate goes up, the viscosity goes down. If n is one, that exponent goes to zero, and the k that we're measuring is the apparent, is, is, the, is the dynamic viscosity of the fluid. And if n is greater than one, this exponent uh, is positive and the fluid is shear thickening. So let's look at some, some data. Lots of food products are viscous and we have a library of food um, measurement, measurements we've made on food products for um, these purposes, uh, teaching purposes. So the first fluid we're looking at is a, is a Newtonian fluid, which is corn syrup. So here are the constants that we've got from making the, the, the measurements of shear stress versus shear rate. The exponent is 0.997. So within we can treat this fluid as a, as a Newtonian fluid. There's a linear relationship between the shear stress and the shear rate. And the gradient of this line is the viscosity. So this version or this brand of corn syrup has a viscosity of 20.7 Pascal seconds or 20,700 centipoys, um, and it's it's the classic Newtonian fluid. This is a non-Newtonian fluid. This is mayonnaise. And the first thing you'll notice that's different is we see now the data are curved when we plot them. Um, we're measuring up, accelerating from zero to 40 reciprocal seconds, and then back down again. And we're looking for hysteresis. And I'll show you a an example of that in a second. So shear stress up, shear rate down, the yellow and green circles are the apparent viscosity. And you can see how much the viscosity drops as the shear rate increases. At one reciprocal second, this fluid has a viscosity of almost 120,000 centipoise. At 10 reciprocal seconds, it's just less than 20,000 centipoise. So another food product ketchup and ketchup exhibits hysteresis. The red diamonds are the uh, accelerating uh, acceleration curve. The blue diamonds are the deceleration curve. So what do we know about ketchup? If we open the bottle and we turn it upside down, it's not going to flow. We have to shake it to get it out of the bottle. So a lot of fluids develop a weak structure between particles and that structure has to be broken 
before the fluid will move. And that's what we're seeing. As the curve accelerates, we see these little jumps as the structure is broken. And as we come back down again, it's much more um, uniform. It fits the curve. So for many food products and personal products like shampoo and body wash, the formulators, the people who are developing the recipes, build this behavior into the recipe the, with the viscosity modifiers. Because one of the things that we experience when we eat food is, is its texture. How does it feel in our mouths? And if, it, if this property is built into the fluid, then we have to design mixing equipment that's able to handle that, um, that property. Um, so one question we might have for the customer is, uh, do you ever expect the mixer to stop for long enough for this structure to build? Because then when we look at the startup protocol for the agitator, we have to take this into account. But it's something we can measure. It's something we can talk about and make sure that we and our customers understand the consequences of, say, trying to start up in a stationary liquid. And then finally, we have a shear thickening liquid. This is cornstarch, where the viscosity increases with shear. Um, so how should the agitator be designed? I mean, if, if the viscosity is increasing the shear rate, should we be aiming to design a piece of equipment that runs at low shear? And the, again, these are questions that we need to address as we as we size the equipment. So let's have a look at a low viscosity turbulent blending process. This is water. This is an impeller called a hydrofoil that looks a bit like a boat propeller. The tank diameter is two feet. The impeller is just about seven inches and it's operating at 102 RPM. We're going to add a tracer. Color is going to change and just watch it mix in. And you can see it mixes very quickly, even at this low speed and low power input, the tank, it becomes uniform, certainly to, our, our, to what our eyes can detect, it becomes uniform very quickly. So now we're gonna change the color from pink to clear, change it back again, watch that happen. Here we go. You can see this, this mixer pumps downwards. You can see that the bottom of the vessel clears before the top. So very, very quick, order of seconds and a well-designed agitator operating in the turbulent regime, even in an industrial scale tank will mix in the order of seconds, tens of seconds. So now let's look at what we're talking about today. So this is a different hydrofoil. Um, sorry, this is a different hydrofoil. It looks more like a, an aeroplane wing. And you can see, so this is a moderate, well, quite sheer thinning fluid. The end value is 0.4 operating in the laminar regime. And you can see the, the, be the beads in this region that's mixed are moving. The beads outside that region are not moving. So this is what we have to deal with. This is what we're, we're trying to um, overcome. So this is a plot of the dimensionless blend time which is the product of the mixer speed and the blend time that's being measured. So it's dimensionless versus the Reynolds number. So this is for a turbine, brushed and turbine type impeller uh, with, in a vessel with baffles. So in the turbulent regime, power number, which is a drag coefficient representing how much force is required to move the fluid as it, uh, impeller as it moves through the fluid, versus the dimensionless mixing time. And the dimensionless mixing time is constant. As we move 
As Reynolds number decreases and we move into the transitional regime, the power number is still constant, more or less, but the blend time is inversely proportional to Reynolds number, which means it's proportional to the viscosity of the fluid. And then we drop down into the laminar regime, where the Reynolds number is inversely pro proportional to Reynolds number. But you can see that the, the relationship between the blend time and the viscosity is just taken off. The exponent measured from these data is minus 10. Much more significant effect of viscosity as we chop down into the transitional and the laminar regime. So, so what's happening? So the picture on the right is uh, made using laser Doppler anemometry, and it shows the velocities along the radius of the impeller, local velocities, as the impeller spins in water. And the plane of measurements is, is that red line. So in turbulent and transitional flow, turbines and hydrofoils generate a periodic jet, which entra entrains the surrounding fluid. So as the viscosity increases and Reynolds number decreases, the impeller digs a hole for itself. And no pumping occurs. You can still, it will still spin, it will, you can measure power, but there's no pumping. So in the same way as we choose pumps, centrifugal pumps versus um, positive displacement pumps, we need to choose a positive displacement impeller. And traditionally, this has been a helical ribbon. And we choose helical ribbons because they generate axial flow. So this is a picture of a helical ribbon. We like double ribbons because they're balanced mechanically. Um, these are some pretty standard ratios of the height diameter, the tank diameter, the width of the blade and the pitch. And the pitch is the vertical distance that you would fall if, as you turn through 360 degrees around the ribbon. And these are the um, uh, I mean, or the, the quantities that these letters represent, the, the geometrical quantities. So why do we like helical ribbons? Because in the, in the laminar regime, the dimensionless blend time for a helical ribbon, the dimensionless blend time for a helical ribbon is constant. And the value of N of, is geometry dependent, and we, we can estimate what that is. I'm not going to talk about that today in the interests of time, but we, we are able to do that. And so one of the questions that we might ask ourselves is what is the most energy efficient design, which uses the lowest power to achieve the shortest blend time? The reason that's important is that our agitator is putting mechanical energy into the fluid, which is converted to heat. And heat transfer in the laminar regime is, is quite inefficient. So we would like to find an impeller with that can achieve our process result, achieve our blend time for the lowest power, power and energy input. So we've talked about how we define viscosity. For, and, and so now what we need to do is understand the behavior of non-Newtonian fluids and how we can take their behavior into account in the sizing of equipment. So we've got rules and correlations, the blend time correlations or the data we've seen uh, apply to Newtonian fluids. But most viscous fluids processed in real industry are non-Newtonian, and we've de described what that means. So can the rules developed for Newtonian fluids be modified to account for non-Newtonian behavior? And we've talked about what Newtonian behavior is, we've talked about what viscosity is. So what we need to do is apply those that understanding to the sizing design of mixing equipment. So there are two regions where, or two processes where viscosity becomes important. The first is the power drawn by the impeller operating in the laminar regime. And this is analogous to pressure drop in laminar flow, in, in laminar pipe flow. What viscosity does the impeller feel? So in order to answer that question, we need to know what is the shear rate at the impeller determining the local viscosity. And the second is the blend time in the transitional and laminar regimes. We saw from the chart that the um, blend time increases as the viscosity drops. So what we need to understand is where is the last region in the vessel to become mixed, to become homogeneous? And what we then need to know is what's the shear rate in that location and the controlling viscosity at that location. 
So let's talk about the first topic, power drawn by an impeller. So the power drawn by an impeller can be is calculated from this equation. P is the power, rho is the density of the fluid, n is the rotational speed, and d is the diameter. So if you have a consistent system of units, and I like the SI system, you can just plug the numbers in. And the power number is a drag coefficient. It determ determines the relation relationship between the power drawn by the impeller and its velocity and its diameter. So in the turbulent regime, the power numbers are constant, as is the friction factor in pipe flow. In the laminar regime, the power number is inversely proportional to Reynolds number. There's a constant of proportionality Kp. And if we substitute this equation into the power number equation, we show that the power is equal to the constant Kp times the viscosity of the fluid times the speed squared times the diameter cubed. And this is a power number, Reynolds number chart taken from a very old paper from 1950, Rushton um, Chemical Engineering Progress. So we see in the turbulent regime, power number's constant. In the laminar regime, power number's inversely proportional to Reynolds number. And the value of Kp is the power number at a Reynolds number of one. So this is for a, a six turbine impellers. The value of Kp for a helical ribbon impeller is, is about 300, because there's a lot more metal, there's a, a lot more drag. So power drawn in the laminar regime. So we need to estimate the shear rate at the impeller in order to estimate the viscosity, estimate the viscosity that the, the power drawn and the viscosity that the impeller feels. So the de method developed was first published by a professor from the University of Delaware, Art Metzner and his student Otto. Metzner and Otto is a very classic paper in the world of mixing, 1957. So basically what Metzner and Otto did is they calibrated the impeller as a viscometer. So they measured the power drawn in the Newtonian, in the Newtonian fluid and extracted the value of Kp for the impeller. Measured the power, know the speed, know the diameter, Newtonian fluid, so we know the viscosity. Then they measured the power draw in a non-Newtonian fluid, knowing the value of K and N. That gave them the apparent viscosity, and we could say apparent viscosity because it's, it's the viscosity at the shear rate. So we've measured Kp in the Newtonian fluid. We get extract the um, apparent viscosity. Then if we substitute that viscosity into the power law relationship, we can get the shear rate. So the impeller shear rate is proportional to the rotational speed of the impeller, which is what it's a dimensionally consistent e equation, which is very uh, relieving. Um, and so we need to know the constant of proportionality. So um, for turbine impellers, pr marine propellers, hydrofoils, it falls in the range of about 12 to 14. For helical ribbons, it's 30. But as long as we know Ks, we know the K and the N values for our fluid, we can estimate the power drawn by the impeller quite accurately If we once we've decided on its speed and diameter. So let's talk about blending. So this is a, a mixing tank, a tank. We've got a, an impeller, turbine impeller and baffles. And we have three conductivity probes, one underneath the impeller, one halfway between the wall, uh, sorry, the shaft and the wall, and one behind the baffle. So the first thing we can see is that when we're operating in the turbulent regime, low viscosity, it doesn't matter where we measure within the experimental the error of the experiments, the blend time is the same wherever we measure it. But as the Reynolds number drops into the transitional regime, the dimensionless blend time measured in the bulk of the tank rises uh, slightly, but the blend time measured at the wall of the tank and behind the baffle is, inverse, is inversely proportional to Reynolds number and inversely proportional uh, and proportional to the viscosity of the fluid. So we can say that the bulk of the tank is turbulent or transitional, but at the wall of the tank and the surfaces, the flow is laminar. 
And that's an important result. It's a, we're going to use that uh, to develop a model in order to determine what the viscosity of the wall tank is. So the Reynolds numbers are greater than 100 in our, in our data set. So as far as the power input is concerned, we, the power number is more or less constant. But the blend time is proportional to the viscosity of the fluid. So what's happening as, as the fluid moves away from the impeller, the viscosity is dampening the turbulence it's created. So the wall region is laminar. So um, this is the region where we need to know the viscosity to correlate with the blend time. And so this is easy for Newtonian fluids. The viscosity is the same throughout the tank. So what is the viscosity at the wall for non-Newtonian fluids? So how do we get that? So we've got our impeller spinning, exerting, it has a tip speed V tip, and it's exerting a force on the fluid, uh, F sub imp. And that's balanced by the torque on the shaft. The fluid moves tangentially in the, in the middle of the tank. It's moving with the velocity V sub bulk. And when we get to the wall of the tank, the velocity is V sub theta. So if we look at the, the velocity at a distance r from the wall of the tank, the shear rate at the wall is V sub theta divided by R. That's the shear rate that we want to be able to uh, estimate. The fluid is exerting a force on the baffles, and that's proportional to V sub theta squared times the area of the baffles. And there's also a frictional force, um, which is equal to the area of the wall and the base in contact with the fluid multiplied by the shear stress of the wall. So if we do a force balance, the, the force input by or exerted by the impeller on the fluid must be equal to the forces on the baffles and the force acting on the wall and the base of the tank. And if we can express this system in a mathematical way, we can then extract the shear stress at the wall. If we know the shear stress at the wall, we can get the shear rate at the wall. Important to remember that we're assuming that the flow is laminar. The other thing that we're going to assume is that the width of this layer or this region where we're in laminar flow is equal to the width of the baffles. So this is a, the equation we're going to look at. It's from uh, Bird Stewart and Lightfoot Transport Phenomena, the 1960 edition. The torque on the shaft is equal to the viscosity of the fluid times the shear, shear rate at the wall plus the pressure drop on the baffle. So the shear stress multiplied by the shear rate, sorry, the viscosity multiplied by the shear rate is the shear stress. So if we integrate the torque over the tank diameter cubed is equal to a constant times the shear stress at the wall, plus another constant times the density of the fluid, width of the baffle squared, shear stress at the wall over the K value of the fluid to the two divided by N. So if we measure the torque, if we know the T squared and we, we've done the integration for the geometry that we're interested in and we've extracted the, co the constants alpha and beta, we have to solve this equation iteratively, but we can get the shear stress at the wall. If there are no baffles, if it's an unbaffled tank, beta goes to zero and it's you can just solve this equation algebraically. So the shear stress at the wall, sorry, shear rate at the wall, is the shear stress at the wall divided by K raise the one over N. If I know the shear rate at the wall, I can get the viscosity at the wall. So this, da this data set, the diamonds are measurements made in a Newtonian fluid. Sorry, the clear diamonds, open diamonds. The filled diamonds are measurements to made in uh, non-Newtonian fluids. And this, the Reynolds number that we're calculating is based on the viscosity at the wall and everything falls together quite nicely. This is uh, the same plot for a larger diameter pitch plate turbine, one half the tank diameter. And now we've got a small amount of data that's measured in a tank with no baffles. And we can see that taking the baffles out in this regime 
has a beneficial effect. It shortens the blend time at a given Reynolds number and a given power input. Now, if we were to make measurements in the turbulent regime, the blend time would go back up again. The baffles are important for, to help us blend effectively in the turbulent regime. So again, it's back to the question, what is the process result? What's going, going on in the tank? Can we take the baffles out? So this is a correlation. Uh, the, the dimensionless group on the y-axis is the Fourier number, and it takes account of the blend time, the physical properties, and the vessel scale. The dimensionless groups on the x-axis are the power number of the impeller raised to the one-third and the Reynolds number. So the y-axis is dependent on the process result, the size of the tank and the blend time. The x-axis is dependent on the um, what the impeller can do. And we have two regimes, turbulent regime and the transitional regime. And we have two data points up here which don't really fit. And they're measured at a Fourier number greater than one. So provided that Fourier number is less than one or power number to the third Reynolds number is less than 184, we can size and add, and we know the K and the N value, the physical properties of the fluid, we can accurately size an agitator for blending in Newtonian and non-Newtonian viscous fluids. And uh, Triton Tech, we've done this, used this approach many times um, over many years to, to handle um, the design of equipment for these, for these type of processes. So let's talk about yield, a special case of non-Newtonian fluids, a yield stress fluid. So a yield stress fluid is one that we have to exert a certain force on before it will move. If it's not moving, there's no shear rate. The shear rate is a velocity gradient. So if we measure the shear stress, uh, the rheology of the fluid with our viscometer, the yield stress appears as an intercept on the y-axis of the shear stress shear rate curve. So this model is called the herschel bulkley model, and we've got two, we've got three terms that we need to describe the rheology of the fluid: the k and the n values and the tau y. Now, if n is one, we have a special case of the model, which is called the Bingham plastic model, and k is. Uh, called the infinite shear viscosity that represents the resistance after the fluid starts to move. So what does a yield stress fluid look like? So this is a sample that we were sent, was sent to our lab for some mixing experiments. We run the spatula through the surface of the liquid and we leave a trough at the surface and the, the fluid just sits on the spatula. So what this is telling us is that the force of gravity isn't sufficient to overcome the yield stress of the fluid. We need to put more force into it. I mean, so for example, if we were to scrape the surface and flatten it, we could, we could smooth it out, but we would have to exert a force on the surface of the fluid greater than the force of gravity. So we're modeling rheology. The, the equations that we've talked about, the power law, the herschel bulkley and the Bingham plastic models are simply fits of data to a model. There's no physical basis for them. Um, so a yield stress fluid is a shear thinning fluid with a low value of n, the index, and a shear thickening fluid could be a yield stress fluid with a, a, a low yield stress. But we need to design mixes that work, and the yield stress model allows us to do this very competently. So just to give you an example of, of what I've just been talking about. So this is Cornstover, the rheology of Cornstover taken from a paper from Pimanova and Han Hanley. We're measuring the rheology of, of um, Cornstover in water at different concentrations. So as the concentration goes up, the viscosity goes up, but the also becomes more shear thinning. So an imp important thing to notice here, we've got six log cycles on the y-axis versus two log cycles on the x-axis. So if we take the, the k and the n values that are reported in the paper for 20% slurry, the k is 72 pascal seconds to the n, and the n is 0 0.06. So whenever we make measurements, 
and we see a, a, an end value that's less than 0.1, we'll think about treating it as a yield stress good. This definitely is with a yield with a, a um, end value less than 0.1. This fluid definitely exhibits a yield stress. So. On this chart, I've taken the equation that Pimanova and Hanley report for their 20% slurry, and I'm plotting that and plotting that as red diamonds. I call it data, but it's not really. It's it's a calculation based on the that power law shear stress versus shear rate relationship. Then I fit the Herschel Bulkley model to the um, uh, call it data. And it fits really, really well. The yield stress is 45 pascals. The K value goes down, the N value goes up. So we're taking account of some of the curvature through the yield stress of the fluid by, by treating it as a yield stress fluid. Let's look at some more data. So this is data measured for a slurry. Now, the problem with slurries is you cannot measure at very low shear rates. You have to keep the solids in in suspension. So we've got two reciprocal seconds as the lowest we could go. We fit the data to a Bingham plastic and we get a yield stress of 290 pascals. If we just fit it to a power law, the N value is 0.16. It's yeah, very sheer thinning, but which model do we use? So if we extrapolate to, the, to zero, the, the red line will go through the origin the purple line will hit an intercept of 292 pascals. So what's the problem? If we look at what's going on at low shear rates, at 0.1 reciprocal seconds, close to the wall of the tank, the Bingham plastic model predicts that the fluid has a viscosity of nearly 3 million centipoise. The power law predicts that it's 2 million centipoise. So which do you choose? The best way to account or to measure the yield stress of a fluid is to measure at very low shear rate. So this is data that were measured by a customer of ours. It's a polymer. It's measured at a high temperature and pressure. We have a device that allows them to do that. And the best fit of the red circles is to the Bingham plastic model, which is up here. The yields, the infinite shear viscosity is 22,000 centipoise. The yield stress is 330 pascals, which you could almost, you could walk on it. And here's our calculation of the apparent viscosity. It's very, so we've got, you know, three log cycles by three log cycles. Here's the apparent viscosity versus shear rate. So we actually use this information to size an agitator for the customer and it's working fine. So the, the message is you, you can use these, Use the yield stress as a way of sizing equipment, but you have to make sure that what you're measuring is truly a yield stress, or you could end up oversizing, oversizing the equipment. So what does a yield stress look like in a stirred tank? So this is a picture that's taken using X-ray streak photography. We've got X-ray film on the back of the vessel, an X-ray camera on the front of the vessel. So where we see streaks, the fluid is moving. Where we see dots, it's not moving. It, it's the fluid is seeded with, with metal particles. So the, this fluid outside the cavern, this cavern of moving fluid, the fluid is stagnant. And stagna stagnation re leads to a lot of problems. It reduces the operating volume. It plugs outlets. It results in poor incorporation of surface feeds. And it will actually act to insulate heat transfer surfaces. So we need a design rule to size an agitator that, that where the such that the cavern fills the vessel. So the smallest cavern that we'll see is equal to the swept volume of the impeller. In this particular example, the cat we see the boundaries of the cavern and, and we can model it as a as a cylinder, we can model it as a torus. Different researchers have taken different approaches to this. But what we want to do is have the cavern reach the wall of the tank and the base and the surface, ideally. So here's another uh, version of uh, another way of looking at the cavern. So this is measured with laser Doppler anemometry. Where we see black dots, 
the tangential velocity of the fluid is at least 1% of the tip speed. And as we increase from 66 to 200 RPM, the uh, black dots are reaching the wall of the tank and they're starting to extrude up and down. We're starting to fill the region with black dots. And the crosses on this plot represent regions where the impeller is starting to develop low axial velocity. So how, what are we going to do? How are we going to uh, size our equipment? We're going to use a model uh, that Elson proposed called the cavern model. So D sub C is the diameter of the cavern. D is the diameter of the impeller. This is the power number. And this is a Reynolds number that's based on the yield stress of the fluid rather than the viscosity. So we have to add another speed. N squared, D squared, divided by the yield stress is still a dimensionless Reynolds number. So we're going to take this equation, we're going to set the diameter of the cavern equal to the tank diameter, solve the equation, and it tells us, having chose the impeller power number and its diameter, what speed must that impeller run in order to have the cavern reach the wall of the tank? That's our minimum mixing condition, no stagnation. So once the cavern reaches the wall, it grows. It grows axially along the wall. So provided that N is greater than NC, this ratio is greater than one, the height of the cavern relative to the tank diameter can be estimated if we know the value of X for different impellers. So for radial flow impellers pumping towards the wall, X is 0.4 and 0.5, the Rushton and the paddle. For axial flow impellers that are pumping downwards, the cavern is taller. So if we want to fill the cavern the vessel with cavern, with moving fluid, we can size, calculate the impeller for the cavern to reach the wall and then determine how much faster it has to run in order for the cavern to reach the liquid surface. So once the cavern reaches the wall, the height is pr roughly proportional to the speed. So if we double the speed, the power is going to increase by a factor of eight. Power is proportional to the speed cubed. But what we're going to do is we're going to add an, a second impeller at the same, same speed, which will double the height of the cavern, so two times the power. Maybe we add a third impeller for three times the power. But this is basically how we're going to approach the design. Um, cavern reaches the wall of the tank, and we just stack caverns on top of each other until all the fluid is in motion, no stagnation. The other thing that you need to take care of is what's the level if we're emptying the tank we need to make sure that we have mixing very close to the base of the tank so that that fluid will stay in motion as as the fluid as the tank is emptied out of out of the vessel so let's now look at some let's look at some lab testing so the the movie on the left is a scale down of a, of a customer's agitator um, you can see that there's movement around the shaft, there's some vibration on the surface, but there's no motion. The movie on the right is a um, it's the same fluid in, this, in the bucket with um, an impeller called uh, a counterflow, and that's what I'm going to talk about next. But let's just watch this, this go again. As it starts up, the, the the lab engineer has to grab the wall of the bucket. The force exerted by the impeller is reaching the wall of the tank. And you can see the motion on the surface, materials being drawn down. And this was a high solid slurry, um, yield stress of about 300 pascals. And um, the customer had changed the recipe the, the, in such a way that the yield stress went up. The original impellers just couldn't handle it. And so we, we did some lab testing, made measurements, and made a proposal which the customer installed and everything's working beautifully. So the impeller that we sell uh, for, helical, for these processes is called a counterflow. And it's got two blades. Uh, the, the middle portion pumps downwards the outer por portion pumps upwards, or vice versa, depending on the direction that you spin the impeller. 
So why did we develop this? Helical ribbon is commonly used for laminar mixing. Yes, it is, but it's heavy. It's complicated to build. We need close clearance between the tip of the blade and the wall of the tank. So we need accurate vessel roundness, which is makes the vessel expensive as they get bigger. There are other um, impellers sold for laminar mixing, and they include the anchors and the Sumito and Max Blend. Philadelphia Mixing Solutions sells the Counterflow, Lightning Cell, and A620. They're, they're interchangeable. So this is the Counterflow. I've just shown you uh, a model of it. So the spacing and the diameter of the impeller depend on how viscous and how non-Newtonian the fluid is. So the larger the lower the Reynolds number, the more non-Newtonian, we're going to make a larger diameter impeller and, and closer spacing. And this is a drawing of an agitator in a, a slurry tank. These impellers are 320 inches in diameter, 30 horsepower motor. And you see there's a one gearbox here, a double reduction gearbox here, and a triple reduction gearbox here to get the speed down to the operating speed of the impellers. And we'll come back. I'm going to say a few more a few more words about this like this slurry application in, in a minute or two. So, what are the attributes of these impellers? They're generally supplied with a large impeller to tank diameter ratio, uh, certainly greater than 0.6. They actually are quite good for dispersion. They have a high shear zone where the down and up pumping blades meet. So there's a large velocity gradient there, creating a high shear rate. They, we actually can disperse solids into viscous liquids using these, these impellers. So what we've currently tested so far, 200, 2 million centipoise, Reynolds numbers less than 0.1, and yield stress is greater than 100 pascals, 300 pascals. They, they are in existence operating in industrial scale equipment. So we have a correlation for um, the blend time. If it's obviously an important parameter from the process result point of view. So this is the Fourier number that we talked about earlier. This is here's the power number, Reynolds number, and the impeller to tank diameter ratio. So if the customer comes, tells us, here's the size of the tank, here's the liquid depth, um, tells us the blend time. That allows us to calculate the Fourier number and then we can see what Reynolds number we need to operate at in order to achieve that blend time. So there's a lot of scatter. This is mixing in you know, laminar flow. It's, we used conductivity probes. There's a lot of scatter in the data, which I believe is because we were getting a boundary layer around the probes. This is work that we would like to repeat using a more uh, like a, a making video and using a pixel um, analysis type of software in order to, to, to determine the blend time. Not perfect, but it allows us to estimate the blend time in, in these applications using the um, counterflow impeller. Now let's look at a counterflow impeller operating in that same viscous fluid. N is 0.4, quite shear thinning. So we're going to stop the impeller at the, tr at the tracer at the surface and then we're going to restart the impeller and watch how that blob of fluid incorporates into the into the viscous fluid. You can see that the beads are moving around the wall of the tank. They're moving in the middle of the tank. And here's the color changing. See those classic striations. Um, and what the mix is doing is, is basically making those striations thinner so that the final mixing step is, is polished by diffusion. And as we'd expect, putting the tracer in at the top, the the bottom of the tank is the, the last region to clear. But there's no, there are no dead zones, even though that, those beads are on the wall, they're moving. And we're seeing that pink zone at the bottom of the tank get smaller and smaller as, as the mixing proceeds.
let it run for a few more seconds. And I'll show you another movie. So in this movie, we're looking at beads at the surface and how they, they're drawn down. You can see the, the pulsing on the surface as the blade passes. You can see the particles being drawn down the shaft. And as they reach the bottom of the tank, they'll be pumped out towards the wall. And if we watch this for long enough, all the beads will become uniformly distributed throughout the liquid. So the reason I want to show you this is because we did some CFD modeling. So the customer who bought those 320 inch diameter counterflows, they started up their plant, they ran into problems. And the problems were a result of the way they were operating the plant. They were recycling some of the solids and there were a lot of fines in the recycled solids, which changed the rheology of the slurry, making it more difficult to mix. So we did lab testing, we made measurements, we resized the impellers. So the customer, told us that under some circumstances they have to shut down the downstream part of the plant and this vessel acts as a buffer and they need the, to allow the level in the tank to increase and the normal operating level is at uh, the level of the upper coupling on the shaft so the question is can this tank can this impeller still mix when the level is higher than normal and the answer from the CFD is, is yes, it can. We're pulling material down from the surface. We're pumping it up from the base of the tank and um, everything works fine. This, this mix has started up in uh, May of 2019 and has been working fine. No problems um, since startup. And these impellers are larger. They were 320. They're now 360 inches in diameter. And we've added a fourth impeller to take account of the more difficult rheology and viscosity of the fluid. So what does this impeller look like? This is the uh, this is the lower impeller with the upwards angled blade so it fits down into the dished head of the of the vessel. So this is a 360 inch diameter counterflow impeller being assembled in the workshop uh, and I always find this, this picture quite dramatic, quite impressive. Uh, you know, it, it, it works. It, 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 we built it, we, test, we did tests, we built it, it works. So finally, some conclusions. We need a good definition of the process result. Whatever mixing process we're, we're talking about, we need to understand what you, the customer, need in order to achieve your process result. We need good basic data, accurate measurements of rheological behavior when we're working with viscous fluids. We're going to use the Metzler and Otto method to estimate the viscosity for, for power consumption in the laminar regime. We're going to use the wall shear stress model to estimate the viscosity for blend time in the transitional and laminar regimes. And we're going to um, use the cavern model to estimate the minimum speed of the agitator for yield stress fluids. And finally, the counterflow impellers, we've been selling them for many, many years. Counterflow impellers are very versatile. You can start low viscosity, build the viscosity at, until you're operating in the laminar regime and are demonstrated to be a very suitable alternative to helical ribbons. One of the advantages they bring, because they have a lower power number, they can operate at a higher speed. And operating at a higher speed generates a higher shear rate which reduces the viscosity of the lamp of a, a, a shear thinning fluid that the impeller is actually feeding. So with that, um, we will go to questions. I hope you can hear me, everybody. Thank you for participating got a number of questions here that I will um, uh, get to right now. So um, the first question is, in mixing 
in mixing, have you come across an agitator that was heated? So I assume that means the the shaft and the blades that they they have um, uh, pipes or tubes built inside the shaft and inside the blade, so a, some kind of heating medium can be pumped through through the agitator itself and i think my the answer is no i i've not seen that i i su suppose in principle it could be done but you'd need to have a, a a rotating union to um connect the the fluid flowing through the rotating shaft to the stationary feed pipes um if you mean um have I come across an agitator where the vessel is heated? Yes. I mean, jacketed vessels and vessels with coils in are, are very, very common in in the mixing in mixing processes, both viscous and, and low viscosity. Um, second question, how do these rules apply to high concentration slurry? So I, I think at the end we the example uh, what that that's actually a cold slurry. It's it's a it's a cold slurry. So as long as you can if you have a low concentration slurry and you turn the mixer off, the particles will settle. And, and there's a different set of rules for sizing an agitator for that kind of application. If you have a high concentration slurry where the, the, in, the interaction between the particles, the particle particle friction is the, the, the movement of the fluid, you can essentially treat the fluid as a single phase non-Newtonian material. And as long as you can measure the viscosity and the yield stress, if it has a yield stress, you can then use the, the, the same rules to size the equipment. And that's basically this these 30 feet diameter um high counterflow impellers. That's how we that's how we designed them. Uh, question how big can a helical ribbon impeller be made? I've seen them built for um, tanks that were 12 feet in diameter. So in this process, some polymer was coming from the chemical plant, and then it was being spun into fibers. So that there was a sort of wide spot in the line where small variations in the polymer properties could be evened out by sitting in this um, this large volume tank. But it's a polymer, it's a polymer solution. It, it needed a helical ribbon to, well, at the time, maybe we would have done it with counterflows today, but back then the, the agitators were w that were used were, were counterflow impellers. Uh, sorry, not counterflow impellers, were helical ribbon impellers. Is there any difference in calculating KNN using common Brookfield instead of a rheometer or a coet viscometer that you use? Um, the answer is no. I mean, a, a viscometer is a rheometer. I, I would use those words interchangeably. Um, a rheometer is a viscometer. A coet viscometer is a certain type of viscometer. Um, no, I would say they are the same. It's the same thing. The Brookfield viscometer is a Brookfield rheometer. Some have more features in terms of being, you know, using a computer to control the the measurements, the measurement protocol, and then to an record the data and analyze. But short answer is a viscometer is a rheometer. A rheometer is a viscometer. Um, and that's so another question that maybe somewhat relevant. Can you advise on how to make viscosity measurements? You need a viscometer. Um, uh, you put the sample in in the in the cup. You add the bob. Um, uh, you make the. Measure. I mean, I, I guess I'd be interested if you would like to drop me an email directly. Uh, I would be more ha happy to kind of chat with you in a bit more detail about what you mean by that that question. But there are different techniques. A coet viscometer. Another way of doing it is to pump the um, fluid a thin, a narrow tube, a, a capillary viscometer, and you measure the pressure drop. So at different flow rates and different velocities, the shear rate that the fluid experiences will be different. And you so you can relate the pressure drop to the shear stress and, and then plot shear stress versus shear rate. The shear rate is eight times the mean velocity divided by the diameter of the pipe.
Um, so yes, that different ways to do it. Um, what would be an ideal strategy for large concrete tanks of shear thinning fluids? So the, I guess the question is, if it's concrete, is it cylindrical or is it square or rectangular? And generally, my experience is that if a tank's made of concrete, um, it's going to be square or rectangular. So is it square? Is it rectangular? If it's square, then you could probably do it with one impeller. And, and the way that we would generally do it is so the, the, the dimension related to the tank that's important is the tank diameter. If you have a angular tank, the, the dimension that's important is the diagonal across across the tank, whether it's square, you know, or, or one side longer than the other. So we would look at that and also then look at the ratio of the short side to the long side. So you can get to a point where one agitator in that tank alone is not going to do the job for you. You're going to need to put two, two impellers in. So I... Um, I think the answer to a lot of mixing questions is it depends. In this case, it definitely depends on the geometry of the tank. Definitely, you can mix shear thinning fluids using multiple mixes. But um, answer is yes. But again, I'd be quite interested to learn more about your process, the shape of the tank, the depth of the liquid. So we could maybe talk in a bit more detail about about what you're doing and this actually might be an ideal application for computational fluid dynamics modeling um, to, to kind of assess the, the mixing in the tank I mean, if you think about the corners of a square tank they're quite you know to get mixing to get the fluid to flow out into those corners is quite difficult even in a if with a water-like fluid and once you add viscosity and shear thinning behavior on top of that uh, of those um issues or those those problems it becomes come becomes even more more difficult um, um okay so back to the question on uh have we come across a shaft that was heated so we want to keep the agitator from being a being a heat sink um the, the shaft is going to be a heat sink, yes, but relative, I guess you could do a, a, a kind of, a cal, and let's say look at the heat losses through the wall versus the heat losses through the shaft. At some point, you're going to reach some equilibrium temperature uh, and, and I guess it, my short answer again. If, I'm, I'm intrigued. I'm intrigued by your question. And if you'd like to contact me directly, please send me an email. But yes, the the shaft is going to be a sink, but I'm not sure how big a sink it's going to be relative to the heat losses through the through the wall of the tank. Uh, so again, I, I I don't know, and I'd like to talk to you more. If you would like to talk to me, please send me an email. Um, then what about the spacing between these impellers? Um, so as I said, talking about the counterflows, as the fluids become thicker and more shear thinning, we would tend to make the impeller diameters larger. So the tips are closer to the wall of the tank, and then we put more of them in the tank. So the the I, I, my general answer to your question is it depends on, on the rheology of the fluid. How thick is it? How shear thinning is it? Does it have a yield stress? And, and so we would make those measurements, look at the size of your tank, look at the process result that you're, you want to achieve and make the decision about the, the, the diameter of the impellers relative to the spacing, uh, diameter of the tank and the spacing relative to the distance from the liquid from the base of the tank to the liquid surface based on the answers to those questions. But yeah, we, we have very specific design rules that we can use to those questions. Um, next question, what is the role of, uh, what is the role or application of baffles in a cylindrical tank with viscous mixing? Um, I would say they have no role. Uh, I mean, as I mentioned in the, presentation that the dead there's a dead zone behind the baffles 
and if you take the baffles out the the rate of blending near the wall of the tank becomes equal to the rate of blending in the bulk of the tank so we would look at the um we would look at the range of Reynolds numbers so so let's let us take an uh, an example let's say you're you're starting off low viscosity water like you add solids if if that was all you were doing then we'd say yes you definitely need baffles to to maintain the the particles in in suspension but if the viscosity is increasing we might kind of sacrifice some of our mixing performance in low viscosity to make sure that we do a good job of mixing when when the viscosity gets gets is higher so we actually have we go from a range where you have standard plate baffles to um pipe baffles so there's there is, rather than having a flat body you have a a circular body so which allows the fluid to to travel you know pass by the va the, the baffle um more effectively to a point where we take the baffles out completely um you know low low reynolds number highly viscous fluid take take the baffles out completely and i, I mean it's I, I, I kind of say this a lot to people, partially jokingly, but it depends. What's the what's the viscosity? What's the Reynolds number? What's the range of viscosities that you expect to experience in your process? And then another question is: if I'm especially in when people are making paint, the, ba the paint hangs up on the baffles, and and so you you take the baffles out. Uh, and maybe sacrifice some mixing performance simply because it makes the, the tank easier to clean between batches. You don't want your your red paint being contaminated with blue pigment that's left behind from the the, the batch that you made made previously. So um, I know it's kind of maybe frustrating for you to hear me say this, but it depends. And again, if you would like to contact me directly by email, I'd be more than happy to. Um, chat with you a little bit more about and, and maybe give you a more um satisfying answer to your question um so let me see any more questions coming in okay well so um i'd like to thank i don't have any more questions on my list so i'll say this if if you have if you think about any other questions that come up in in the next week or so absolutely feel free to drop me an email i i'm more than happy to chat with you about your mixing processes whether just a chat or whether it's an opportunity for us to work together in in in, in a more detailed or in-depth way in the future i'd like to thank you all for attending and um well again thank you have a have a great afternoon or a great morning or evening wherever you are located in the world so thanks again thanks for attending and um uh, I hope you uh, learned something useful from it. Thanks again. Bye for now.